All right, so there's these two misconceptions that I often encounter in regards to the Python programming language. I've encountered them both in professional settings as well as just reading through comments on the internet and stuff like that. And they seem pretty pervasive despite being completely wrong. Well, mostly completely wrong. The first one is that Python is a single-threaded language. This one is just patently false, and I can show that very quickly in a second here. The second one is if you want to use multiple cores from your computer in Python, don't use threading and instead use multiprocessing. This one is a bit layered because it's technically true. So if you are using pure Python only, then this definitely makes sense. And the only context in which you should use threads is if your code is waiting on IO in some way. If you're trying to do something that's computationally heavy or requires the use of multiple cores from your computer, using threading is not going to get you anywhere. However, when was the last time that you were doing something computationally intensive using Python and were using just pure Python? I'm going to bet the answer is almost never, because you were probably using NumPy or SciPy or Numba or Cython or calling some C library or using PyTorch or, you know, a myriad of things. And when you change your context that way, this statement stops being entirely true. And I'll show examples of that as well. So let's debunk the first of these misconceptions, that Python is a single-threaded language, and that whenever you create a thread in Python, what you're doing is creating a green thread and not a system thread. Debunking this one is relatively straightforward. I have an htop instance open on the left, and I have put it into the tree view and searched for the Python process. So here I have opened an IPython session in my virtual environment RL, and I'm going to go to that on the terminal on the right. As you can see, there is only one thread under this sort of main process. That's the main thread. So we're going to go ahead and import threading and then create a new thread. And then I like to keep most of my threads as daemon threads because that makes sure that they exit whenever the main thread exits. And then we go ahead and start it. Okay, that didn't actually do anything because I forgot to give the thread something to do. So I have... <laughs> I was disproving my own disproval. Uh, I have given the thread something to do now. So I just made this function where there's a while loop and it's doing something. And uh, now when I create the thread, I give it a target and then set the daemon equal to true and start. And now you can see on the left, we have a second, a second thread under the main IPython process. And we can do this again. We can make a T2. And bam. Every time we start a new thread in Python and actually give it something to do, we get a new thread show up at the system level in htop. So this, as far as I'm concerned, definitively proves that Python is absolutely not a single-threaded language and that Python threads are quote-unquote real threads that are managed by the system and they're not managed by some internal event loop and they're not green threads. Now, whenever it comes to async, which is something that you definitely should use if you are dealing with a lot of IO or, you know, just if you're doing web related work in general and doing a lot of web calls, you should use async and async is running green threads. It is absolutely a single threaded process, but threading in Python proper is not green threads. It's proper threading. Now, this, of course, brings us to point two which uh, is another misconception. But like I said, it's not quite a misconception if you're only doing pure Python work. So then comes the question, if threading is quote unquote real in Python, then why can't we just use threading to make use of multiple cores? Which I've said before, if you're using pure Python code, you can't do. The reason for this is the infamous global interpreter lock or GIL. I'm going to refer to it as GIL from now on. And what the GIL does is that it forces every thread that is running Python bytecode to acquire a shared lock first. So if you are writing only pure Python code, then you have to acquire that shared lock. And because of that, at best, you're only ever going to be able to use one core. This is why when your code is pure Python, the recommendation is to use the multiprocessing module because that's going to launch a separate process. It is going to launch a separate Python interpreter under the main Python interpreter process. And then any communication is going to happen through pickling. That's not entirely true in Python 3.8, but that's that's new. And so it has a higher RAM burden, but it does allow you to use multiple cores on your computer, even for pure Python code, because it is literally running multiple instances of Python. However, 
As I said before, if you're doing any kind of computationally intensive work, you are probably using something like NumPy or Numba or Cython or any number of other things. When you do something like that, you can actually kind of get away from the restriction of acquiring the global interpreter lock. One example of this is if you are acting purely on NumPy arrays, you can safely release the global interpreter lock to do whatever work you were going to do. In fact, NumPy does this internally. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a page from my Numba video and show you an example of this happening with a function that I have JIT compiled with Numba. Okay, so I've gone ahead and written a function that I'm going to that I've already wrapped in the ngit wrapper from Numba. It doesn't seem to take very long, primarily because we're jitting it, so I'm going to change it so that it does take somewhat longer, a reasonable amount of time. Okay, clearly I am way underestimating the modern CPU, but I think it's fine. We can just throw a lot of threads at it. So I really like to use the thread pool executor. Uh, let's give it eight workers because I have eight cores, I guess four physical cores and four virtual cores. And then I like to use x.map. And in this case, I'm just going to give it a dummy array and just have it do a bunch of work. Uh, I forget if the function goes first or not. Ah, function goes first and the iterable goes second. And it's going to need to take an argument. So let's change the definition. We're not going to do anything with that input. And we'll jit it again. And then we can give it some ridiculous input. That went far too long, far too quickly. Okay, so now that this is running, you'll see that in HTOP, there isn't quite a difference. Like, I'm not slamming all the, all the CPUs. There's this peak that you'll see that bounces from core to core as the OS is uh, scheduling the thread in, in different locations. And here, under the main Python process, you see the CPU percentage is only 100%. This is the case because we haven't explicitly told Numba to let go of the global interpreter lock. We can do that. There we go. So now what we've done is that we've explicitly told Numba, hey, this does not need any interaction with the Python interpreter. And as you know, the code that we've written for this function really does not. So now that we have told it, if we go ahead and run that same uh, insane thread pool executor again, you'll see that it is actually able to at least break the 100%. Now, this is not particularly useful in its own right. The computation that we're doing here is not particularly heavy. Now, the previous example that I just showed was not computationally very heavy by itself. So while I was able to show that the main Python process was able to go beyond 100% CPU usage and start using more than one core, it wasn't particularly satisfying. So instead, I've written up this function that creates a very large matrix and then multiplies it by itself and returns the result. Now, as I mentioned before, NumPy will sometimes do its own threading in the background. But as far as I know, it doesn't do that for matrix multiplication. It does that for matrix inversion and some other processes. We'll see. So let's first go ahead and run this guy without any global interpreter lock. So let's first go ahead and run this guy without releasing the gil. So we see the same kind of behavior. We see a bunch of spikes, but the CPU utilization never goes above 100%. So now we'll go ahead and make sure that the global interpreter lock is released when this function is called. And bam, there we have it. So whenever you can get rid of this restriction on Python threading, which is that it needs to acquire the global interpreter lock in situations where you don't need that, even with just standard Python threads, you can use your CPU, you know, almost to its full capacity. And this is very useful because the RAM impact of using Python threads is significantly less than using multiprocessing. Oh, and this is very interesting. I decided to use process pool, pool executor to just show that difference. And first of all, uh, it's using roughly 10 gigabyte more RAM now than it was before with thread pool executor. And second, Somehow, even though I've told it to use eight workers, it's really able to only use four cores at best. Huh, that's very interesting. So here, uh, in this particular example, the process pool executor actually does worse. 
So hopefully this demonstration of the nuance behind Python threads and the global entrepreneur lock and how when you can get around it, you should get around it, and that'll most likely give you very good performance in general. Hopefully this has been useful and clears up some of the confusion around Python threading for some people. Thank you very much for watching this video. If this was useful to you and if you liked it, just hit that like button and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Let me know in the comments if there's any other Python related videos that you'd like me to do. And see you next time. Bye.